Please join me in our responsive call to worship. It's printed in your bulletin and also, of course, will appear on the screen as well. It's taken from the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. The people who walked in darkness have seen the great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them the light has shined. Let us celebrate the light of the world. Now let's come before the Lord in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Our gracious and loving God, may the presence of your Holy Spirit in our midst this morning give us cause to rejoice along with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. As a family, together we rejoice in unison over blessings that you have bestowed upon us. We praise you, O God, for our salvation, made possible by the atoning sacrifice of your Son upon the cross. We praise you for the needs that you have met in our life, and we praise you for the open line of communication between you, our Creator, and we, your creation. Hear, O God, these are prayers of praise in the name who, of him who first taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Now let's open our hymn books, number 58, and the hymn also appears, of course, on the screen, to our first hymn for this morning, a hymn of praise called, Our God Reigns.
beautiful hymn? Don't you just love that closing? Amen. So be it, Lord. Please join me in the unison prayer of confession. And following this prayer, as you know, we just take a few moments of silence. And in those moments of silence, we confess to our Lord our own personal sins as well. So let's pray. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy way. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought to have done. And there is no but thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me share with you these words from the book of Micah, chapter 7, verses 18 and 19. Listen carefully. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression? He does not retain his anger forever, because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. You will cast out all our sins into the depths of the sea. What a wonderful promise from God that is for you and for me. Now let's join together in singing our hymn of assurance Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. Good morning, all y'all. As we now prepare our hearts to go to the Lord in prayer, please remember all that's going on in Turkey. Every time I turn on the TV, it seems like they add many, many more to that number. 
There was a leader just before I left to come here this morning that acknowledged that he believes that that number that's been shared with us, I think it's around 28,000 now, that that may double. But please note that as we continue to pray. And then that, let us now go to the Lord in prayer. Because you first loved us, we love you. And Lord, it is in you that we find true life. We also realize, Lord, that it is you that invites us to pray to you. And so this morning, Lord, we do that in and through the good and strong name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We also thank you, dear God, that we're able to gather here this day. We're grateful that you keep us safe. that have not been safe due to disasters as well as other areas of difficulty within their lives. And Lord, we think of primarily Turkey. We think of all the families, all the destruction. We think of all the workers that are there now helping. And Lord, we know that we're to love our neighbors so that we do know that our country will take a stand and will be helping aid in any way that is possible. We pray, Lord, that it will be received and that you will be glorified through all that it takes place there. We also, Lord, thank you so much for this church and for the many people who devote time to serve you in it. There are many opportunities for ministry. We reach out in this community through the local ministries at the Christian Care Center. We have missionaries in Mexico that we help support. We have many areas within our small groups, including our Shaw ministry. Lord, we also try to help in many other areas too. And Lord, just as large and powerful, you are also intimate and personal. And we lift to you the concerns of our personal daily lives. Some of them are spoken and some of them are unspoken, but they're upon our hearts this morning. And Lord, we lift up also all of the names of whom they're upon our hearts. There are some that have been added this day. And again, Lord, you know every hair on their head, and you know every situation of need, whether it be emotional, spiritual, or physical. We lay all of that to your feet this morning. Lord, we also pray for our families, our friends, and our loved ones. We pray, too, for our nation. We also pray for all of our leaders, that they would turn to you and that they would rely on you for all the decisions that they make. We also, Lord, think of our military. I know there are many veterans among our particular body, but also, Lord, among our family members, we have some that are still serving this day. We pray for all of them as well as all of our military personnel, as well as all the families, because they too give so much of themselves. We also realize, Lord, that prayer does make a difference. But we also know that we are called to act in your name. So, Lord, give us hearts that are open to you. As this wonderful message that was shared with us through our morning Bible study through Jim Davids, Lord, we thank you so much acknowledging the fact that everyone is our neighbor. And Lord, we ask for the courage to reach out to minister to all of those around us. Lord, blessed indeed be your name day by day, and blessed be your church, so that all praise, glory, and all honor may come to you. Amen. And now if our ushers would please prepare for the presentation of our tithes and offerings. Toward the end of the choir anthem this morning, I'm gonna turn and ask you to stand and sing the words that will be printed on the screen. I think they'll be very familiar to you.
dear Heavenly Father, you remind us that faith without love is meaningless. So Lord, we present these gifts of our tithes and offerings with love. And we rejoice in the ability to be able to do so. May this moment of giving warm our hearts and stir our souls so that we remember to act consistently out of love, all in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, in whose name we pray, Amen. Please be seated. Our Unison Confession of Faith, of course, is printed in your bulletins as well as will be shown on our screens. And our Confession of Faith this morning is taken from the Evangelical Presbyterian Church's Essentials of Our Faith, number three. The Holy Spirit has come to glorify Christ and to apply the saving work of Christ to our hearts. He convicts us of sin and draws us to the Savior. Indwelling our hearts, he gives us money like our lust and empowers and imparts all he gives to us for service. He instructs and guides us into all truth and seals us for the day of redemption. The scripture reading this morning is from Isaiah chapter 29, verses 11 through 16. And the vision of all this has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. When men give it to one to read who can read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. And when they give the book to one who cannot read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot read. And the Lord said, because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men, therefore behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people, and with wonder on wonder, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. Ah, you who hide deep from the Lord your counsel, whose deeds are in the dark, and who say, who sees us, who knows us? You turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay that the things made should say of its maker, he did not make me, or the form say of him who formed it, he has no understanding. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Lois. Our sermon title this morning is Show Me the Spirit. I'm certain by now you looked at the passage of scripture that I chose, and God led me to that. And I was originally going to ask Mandy to print out the whole book here of 1 Corinthians, but um, I think she would have been a little upset with me. So I tried to narrow it down. So our scripture reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 18, continuing through the second chapter, verse 16. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, dear God, for your written word and the opportunity that we can freely gather together and read it as well as proclaim it. So Lord, this day, as your word is read and as it is proclaimed, we ask that you don't use it just for head knowledge, but by the power of your spirit, use it for transforming heart changes within us to become more like your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. A reading of Paul's letter from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. Christ, the wisdom and power of God. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful, 
Not many were noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yet, among the mature, we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. Not of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person, which is in him? So also... No one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit of who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. Of God. For they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Now, with my conversations with many, I understand that many people love to research their background, in particular their family trees. Well, there are many websites that have been created to help us find more information about our genealogy. And there are also even some companies that if you will send them a saliva sample or maybe even a a blood sample, they they will provide you with an amazing amount of family information. In fact, I believe now there's even a television show where many famous people will be brought and introduced and they'll be surprised to hear about their their backgrounds. In fact, so much so of their family trees that they're even shocked on who that they found out they were related to. Well, two weeks ago, I mentioned that the theme of the Old Testament was given to us in the fifth chapter of Genesis, in particular in the first verse. And it reads, this is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Yes, God created man in his own image, but man sinned, thus defiling and deforming that image. And then man, Adam and Eve, brought forth children in their own likeness after their own image. And sadly, These children proved themselves to be sinners just as their parents did. So no matter where we look throughout the Old Testament, we see sin and we see sinners. But in the New Testament, beginning with the book of Matthew, we read that very first verse, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. 
Now, the people of Israel were waiting for their Messiah. They were waiting for their king to arrive. In Matthew, he showed how that Jesus was a descendant of David and Abraham, the father of the Jews, just as the Old Testament had predicted, fulfilling all of its prophecies about the Messiah's lineage. The first of many proofs recorded by Matthew to show that Jesus was, in fact, the true Messiah. Well, without this ancestry, many of those among whom Jesus lived and those to whom he ministered to would not have taken his teaching seriously. This made his genealogy crucial. Well, as Christians, even more important than our family ancestry is our spiritual genealogy. Have you ever taken the time to have a conversation with your sons and daughters or your grandsons or granddaughters and told them how that you came to a saving faith in Jesus? Have you told them about the men and women or possibly the boys and girls that influenced you both in person and through possibly what they lived or in what they wrote? Well, mapping out our spiritual heritage is a very powerful experience. It reminds us to be grateful for those whom planted as well as watered the seeds of faith within our personal life, helping us to form a very solid spiritual foundation. Now that's very important for us to remember. Because you see, if we are surrounded currently by many, many people that do not think as we think, we are surrounded by people who have built their lives on a very different foundation than the one of which that we have through Jesus Christ. Now we read here in 1 Corinthians, in this first chapter, Paul wrote this beginning with verse 20. He wrote, Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demanded signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. You see, Christianity does not exist in a bubble. And we are constantly exposed to the false teaching and false philosophies of this entire world. Oh, we go to church on Sunday, but you see, the rest of the week, we are being constantly exposed to people who do not believe and think as we do. We go to shows, we watch movies, we go to plays, we, we spend time with friends and with relatives, we spend time watching our televisions or surfing the internet, we read many books and newspapers and magazines. But every place we go, we're being exposed to somebody who doesn't buy into our Christianity. They may even reject or mock God's kind of thinking. And... Since a lot of these people are very smart and very influential, we might be led to possibly doubt or even question what we believe. Now, there are going to be times when you and I are going to feel outgunned and outmatched. Now, the Apostle Paul, he wanted to set this issue straight. And on the face of things, we are outgunned. We are outmatched. But again, Paul wrote here in 1 Corinthians, in his first chapter, beginning with verse 26, he wrote, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards, and not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. And then Paul wrote about himself, right, over in the second chapter, beginning with the first verse. Paul wrote, I, Paul, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. And then down at verse 3. And I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. 
And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Well, Paul's point was this. Just looking at the church, the world will tend to look at us as being not very smart. The world looks at us to be not be very eloquent and not being very important or even persuasive. They often see us as very weak and maybe even very foolish. If that's true, then how in the world are we ever going to win the world for Christ? I mean, we're not eloquent. We're not persuasive. We're not even all that important to many people. Well, I believe that that's why so many churches and preachers try so very hard to be very eloquent and to be very persuasive and to be very important in this world. Oh, they build majestic buildings and they have powerful preachers and they even will have celebrity guests come to invite to speak to them. They rejoice when their local newspaper or local TV reporter happens to recognize them. And they glory in the praise and the applause of the world. And they believe that if they are popular enough and if they are attractive enough, that they can win the world over to Christ. But Paul says that that, that's a pipe dream. Paul says that the, the world isn't looking for the things that God wants to offer. Some of those in the world are looking for miracles and others in the world are looking for wisdom. But God, he's, he's offering something the world does not embrace. Again, looking at this letter Paul wrote over in the first chapter, the, the 18th verse says this, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So if we, if we can't win people to Christ by our popularity, then what can we do? Well, we can learn to rely less on our impressiveness and more on the Spirit's power. You see, Paul, he also shares this in the second chapter, in the fourth verse. Paul wrote this. He says, Paul, in my speech, in my message, we're not plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Did you catch that? It is the Spirit inside of us Christians that gives us the edge in winning the world. You see, once we became a Christian, God's Holy Spirit came and set up shop within our hearts. So what Paul is telling us here in 1 Corinthians is this. The Spirit is what makes us think and live differently than the rest of the entire world. And it's the Spirit that will make all the difference in our ability to overcome the world. Now, centuries ago, a French philosopher named Descartes, he struggled with the idea of reality. Well, it seemed that he wondered whether or not that he could prove that he even existed, which gives you some idea, I believe, of how bizarre many philosophers are, right? So anyway, since he wondered how he might prove that he actually existed, he racked his brain and he struggled with reasoning and then eventually led him to this famous declaration. He says, I think, therefore I am. <laughs> now that, that's very nice, isn't it? But it's a fairly pathetic statement. Because by contrast, God has something far more impressive to tell you and I. God says this. He says, yes, you exist. I created you. But this is what is really good. God also says this. You think great things because my spirit is inside of you. The spirit is 
Therefore, you think. Now that's what God is telling us. You see, God's spirit inside of us makes us think like God thinks. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Um, verse 12, Paul wrote, verse 12, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. Continuing verse 14, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Verse 16, For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The Spirit makes us think like God thinks. And it is only through the Spirit that we begin to understand how God wants you and I to live. And God's kind of thinking is not reasonable whatsoever to most of the entire world. So again, how on earth would someone without the Spirit of God ever understand these teachings? Well, we see unseen things. We find rest under a yoke. We become wise by being fools for Christ's sake. We're made free by becoming Christ's bondservants. We conquer by yielding. We reign by serving. We are made great by becoming little. We are exalted by being humble. We become strong by being weak. We triumph by defeat. We find victory by glorifying in our infirmities. We live by dying. Well, those things make absolutely no sense whatsoever to those without God's Spirit inside of them. Now, they might be able to comprehend why these statements are true, but they cannot make those principles be a part of their lives because it's God's Spirit is not there to guide them into using them correctly. Now, back in, excuse me, back in 1891, the White House, for the very first time, was wired for electricity. But the president at that time, Benjamin Harrison, he was not happy about it at all. In fact, he and his wife were so fearful of a shock by this new electricity that they wouldn't even touch a light switch. So they continued, because of that, to use gas lights that they were very familiar with. Now that seems very odd to us because we live with electricity all the time, do we not? And in fact, even now, right, many of our politicians want us to drive electric automobiles. Well, yeah, many take the presence of electricity for granted. In fact, even many of us, right, we even have went out and purchased generators because during a hurricane season, if we were to be without electric, boy, I don't think we could live without electric during that time. Well, in that same way, we need to be so used to being guided by God's Spirit that we don't even want to give it much thought. God's Spirit should be so much a part of our lives that we couldn't think of living without that influence. And when that Spirit is in control of our life, the changes that can take place inside of us can make us be a force for God to be reckoned with for the entire world. Now, in closing, several years ago, there was a Christian man who shared how he had become so overwhelmed by the shame of having stolen grapes from a farmer when he was a young child. This memory, it nagged him, and it just nagged his mind over and over and over again. So finally, he felt so convicted from God that he wanted to return to this farmer and make restitution. Well, he went there and he knocked on the door of that farmer's home. And the farmer said, come in. And there sat that farmer on his stool and he's putting on his shoes and now he is way past middle age. I used to steal your grapes from you when I was just a child, he blurted out. But now I'm a Christian and I want to make it right. 
Well, the farmer glanced up at the currency in this man's hands, and he dropped his shoe right on the floor. This farmer says, well, my wife is out in the backyard, and why don't you go talk to her? Well, that young man, he hurried out to that backyard, and when he saw that farmer's wife, he repeated once again his confession, and he handed her that money. Well, she looked at him quizzically and said, thank you. Well, a couple of weeks go by, and he was sharing this experience with a very dear friend of his, and his friend starts to laugh. His friend says, well, did you know that farmer and his wife were atheists and had been atheists their entire life? You really handed him a shocker. And I want to tell you something else. Shortly after you left that day, my brother went and had a conversation with that wife about possibly buying some of their farmland. And for some reason, she went on to tell me about your restitution. And you made quite an impression on them. But that isn't the end of the story. He said a week or two later, again, this young man had a very strong feeling that he should make a return to that farmhouse. He didn't want to go. He, he fought that urging, but then ultimately, a month later, he finally did. He made them a second visit. Well, he once again, he knocked on that farmhouse door, and the farmer's wife this time greeted him. Please come in, she says. I've been asking God to send you back because I wanted you to tell me more about Jesus Christ. Well, she and this young man, they spent over an hour then as this woman asked question after question after question, and she expressed her hunger to know more and more about Jesus. Well, they prayed together, and after they prayed, that young man, he finally got up to leave. This woman says, please, I want to know more. And then taking a hold of this young man's hand, she says to him, can you possibly come back next Tuesday because I'm going to have a lot of friends coming here to visit me, and I know that I've told them, and they want to hear more about this Jesus also. Well, yes, that farmer and his wife, they had been atheists. And they were not going to be impressed by majestic buildings or powerful preachers or even any type of an endorsement of a celebrity. But they were shaken by the power of the Spirit to change the life of this young man who had many years before stolen grapes from them as a child. Renowned atheist Frederick Nietzsche once said this, Show me that you are redeemed, and I will believe in your Redeemer. <laughs> that is the power of the Spirit that lives within us. And that Spirit gives us the ability to show that we are redeemed by the change that God's Spirit brings to our life. All glory be to God. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for your Spirit. We ask, Lord, you would help us to live by its power, knowing that we can't save anyone. But you can. And you do by the power of that same spirit that you indwell us with. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of commitment to close with is on page 433, as well as will be shown in our screens. And all of you that are able, let us please rise and sing together, I Surrender All.
And now as all y'all leave this sanctuary and sign off by way of internet, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Amen. And may God bless all y'all and have a wonderful week, everyone.